Coagulation is unquestionably the most important step in the drinking water treatment process. Coagulation is one of those mysteries of water treatment. If you read a chapter in a textbook on water treatment, you'll find that the authors like to talk about all the things that are not coagulation. They like to talk about the particles and the theory and what might not work and what's always different. And at the end of the chapter, they'll talk about jar testing. And they'll say jar testing is a trial and error approach where you actually optimize the coagulation process to an individual treatment plant. This is all great and good, except when it doesn't work. So traditional jar testing has some flaws. The flaws include sedimentation. All water treatment plants don't produce a settleable flock that would work with the traditional jar testing method. For example, if the water treatment plant has a very low organic carbon concentration and a very low turbidity, it's very unlikely that you're gonna produce a large settleable flock that's gonna work with the jar test. Coagulation controls every process that comes after coagulation, like flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, and disinfection, because if particles are not properly coagulated, they won't flocculate, and if they don't flocculate, they won't settle, and if they aren't properly coagulated, they won't filter either. Coagulation is controlled by a number of important parameters. As you can see on this diagram, the pH, the temperature, the alkalinity, the hardness, the concentration of particles, and the concentration of organics all impact the optimum coagulant dose and coagulation pH. Plus, they all interact with each other, and they vary from one water to the next, and from one day to the next, or one season to the next. Organics are probably the most important part of this diagram, and the concentration of organics varies, the hydrophobicity, the molecular weight, and the structure can all change from one water to the next and even from day to day or season to season. Drinking water treatment is challenging because the particles are small and negatively charged. They're too small to settle on their own. They're too negatively charged to flocculate or stick to any surfaces, including the surfaces inside of the filter. Coagulation has two different mechanisms for overcoming this negative surface charge of particles. The first mechanism is charge neutralization. Charge neutralization is we produce positively charged species to offset the negative charge at the surface of the particle. Unfortunately, this has to be a one-to-one -one balance or very close to it. If we produce all positively charged particles because we overfeed coagulant, then charge neutralization stops working. If we underfeed coagulant and produce too few positive charges, the particles remain negative and this mechanism doesn't work either. The second mechanism of coagulation is sweep coagulation. In sweep coagulation, we don't produce any positively charged species. We simply produce a lot of precipitate, and the precipitate is neutrally charged. The neutral precipitate then entirely coats the surface of the particle, or at least coats it to the degree that it can be flocculated, settled, and filtered. Jar testing is the go-to trial and error method for optimizing coagulation in a drinking water treatment plant. Unfortunately, Jar testing doesn't work at every water treatment facility. Some water treatment facilities produce a charge neutralized flock that is not large and settleable, such that the jar testing method would indicate that sedimentation doesn't work and that the coagulation process was ineffective. When in actuality, the coagulation process worked and the water would filter and produce low filtered water turbidity and meet all regulations. The second limitation of jar testing is that the pH changes when the alum dose changes. So increments of alum dose also change the pH because alum is an acid. If you look at five different alum doses, you also look at five different pHs and this becomes a two variable optimization problem. You're trying to optimize the pH at the same time you're trying to optimize the alum dose. Unfortunately, both are changing at the same time. Jar testing in general and coagulation specifically is a very complex process. There are a lot of variables to optimize. So instead of starting talking about coagulation and jar testing, let's do a, a basketball analogy. So let's talk about an experiment where you're put on a basketball court and you're asked to make a basket. But to make things harder, you're blindfolded and you're spun around several times before the experiment begins and you don't know what direction you're facing. So you get a basketball, you're spun around two times, and you've got six shots and you're trying to make a basket. 
So you shoot the first one, it doesn't go in. You shoot the second one, it doesn't go in. You don't hear anything. You shoot the third one, nothing. Fourth, fifth, sixth, nothing. So what do you do? Well, it becomes very much a, a random problem. You don't know where the goal is, so you don't know which direction to shoot. You don't know how far away you are, so you don't know how hard to shoot. And it becomes nearly impossible to make a basket. But how could we make this process easier? How could we make it easy for you to make a basket while still having two variables to optimize? Well, how about this? How about you're put directly in front of the goal, you're perfectly lined up with the front of the rim, you just don't know how far away it is, you're still blindfolded, and you're given six shots. So the first shot, you shoot it easy, you don't hear anything, it doesn't hit anything. Second shot, same result. Third shot, same result. Fourth shot, maybe you think you hear it hit the net. Fifth shot, maybe it bounces off the backboard. Now you're starting to get close to making a basket in only five shots. Now, if you're given six more shots, what are the odds that you'll make a basket if you shoot between where you hit the net and where you hit the backboard, you finally make a basket. So we had two sets of basketball trials and the first set of basketball trials with two variable optimization, we didn't get anywhere close to making a basket. In the second set, we made a basket, we, we found the optimum, we reached our goal in only two more experiments. What's the difference? Well, in the first experiment, you were trying to optimize two variables at the same time. In the second set of experiments, you're only trying to optimize one variable at a time. We want to do the same thing in drinking water treatment, but we have to redraw the two axes. So we need to redraw the basketball court as the coagulation diagram by Mirtha Raja. So the, the basketball court becomes the jar tester and the six shots become six jars. We'll start with an alum only situation where the pH is gonna change each time we change the alum dose because the alum is an acid. This is another two variable optimization problem and it prevents us from shooting straight towards our goal, which in this case is the dotted region outlined in the center of the sweep zone that we'll call the optimum sweep. To get directly in front of the basket or directly in front of the optimum sweep zone in the coagulation diagram, we would have to add base each time we change or increase the alum dose, such that the pH would stay at a constant 7.5 and we would be situated directly in front of our goal. The only problem with base addition is it only allows us to move to the right side of the coagulation diagram. To move to the left side of the diagram, we have to add acid. Particularly if we want to get to the lower left where we would expect charge neutralization to occur, uh, acid is a requirement. Enhanced coagulation also occurs on the left of the diagram with acid, but typically at higher dosages. The next generation jar testing procedure has two primary innovations. The first innovation is that the pH and coagulant dose are controlled independently through titrations so that it's a one variable optimization instead of a two variable optimization. The second main innovation of the jar testing procedure is to use granular media filters instead of sedimentation because all treatment plants don't produce a large settable flock. So if you have a granular media filter, instead of a membrane filter, instead of a jar for sedimentation, you can actually use the same treatment process that the plant's using and you can optimize the same treatment process with the same coagulation process to get results that are, that are ideally suited to your plant. Now that we've covered the basics of jar testing, let's get into how to conduct a jar test and a list of items you'll need in order to get started.
We recommend using the JAR Test Wizard as this program will guide you through the entire JAR Test procedure and keep records of all of your experiments. We will begin by selecting the standard JAR Test procedure and entering the experimental conditions. For this experiment, we will be using a constant pH of 6.5 and varying the alum concentration as shown. The standard jar test procedure consists of four mixing stages. A one minute rapid mix, followed by a three stage tapered flocculation, and concludes with filtration. Use the time recommended by the jar test wizard for the final stage, as this will depend upon your jar tester. Always standardize your pH electrode prior to conducting any jar test. We recommend you measure and record raw water turbidity, alkalinity, and hardness prior to each jar test in order to track changing water quality between experiments. Before starting a jar test experiment, we need to perform titrations in order to determine the appropriate amount of acid or base needed to keep the pH constant as the alum dose varies. We will follow the titration steps outlined in the jar test wizard. Once the jars are filled with water, center each jar in its position on the jar tester. Then lower each paddle and secure the shaft to prevent slippage and to ensure consistent mixing across the jars. Now fill the syringes with the corresponding volume of coagulant as shown in the jar test wizard. Next, we will add the volume of acid or base determined in the titration step to its corresponding jar. Prior to starting the jar test, place a beaker at each jar, which will be used to collect post-coagulation pH samples at the end of rapid mix.
Begin filtration by opening the valve of the first jar at the completion of the final stage of flocculation. Note that mixing continues throughout the duration of the filtration process. Each subsequent valve will be opened in 30 second intervals. The Jar Test Wizard has a built-in timer, which can be used as a guide for opening valves and collecting samples. Collect filtered turbidity samples approximately two minutes after opening each valve. Once you measure and record the filtered turbidity samples, the Jar Test procedure is complete. The Jar Test Wizard generates a one-page summary report of the experiment as well as stores all of the experimental data within the Jar Test Wizard file. Thank you for watching our instructional video on jar testing. For more information and the latest updates, please follow the link in the description.